We ought to get into the Word as soon as we can because I've got a lot to share with you today. So let's begin uh, our study here in the Psalms by looking at Psalm 32. Psalm 32, beginning at verse 1, and I'll read to uh, verse 11. I'll read the whole psalm to you, and we'll get into our study, Psalm 32. Uh, this is a psalm of David. David writes, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Now, I want you to notice this psalm is a psalm of assurance. It assures us that God is going to forgive us of our sins. Notice with me, it begins in verse 1 and concludes in verse 11 with a call to rejoice. And the reason that he calls us to rejoice is because our sins have been forgiven us. And the point he's going to be making, and we'll see this in detail as we go through this psalm, uh, the point he's making is if we honestly sorrow over our sin, and if we confess our sin, and if we forsake our sin, then God is going to forgive us. When we confess our sins, we do not simply say, I'm sorry, and then just go on with life. Because genuine confession of sin relates to not only saying that I have done something wrong, but it also includes forsaking the sin and seeking God for direction. That's what he points out here in verse 8 when he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. When you ask God to forgive you of your sins, it's not because you regret something that you've done, though regret is part of it sometimes. When you ask God to, uh, to forgive you of your sins, what you're doing in reality is you're agreeing with God and saying that God is right as it relates to sin and as it relates to your life. And so when I confess my sin before the Lord, I not only agree with Him that I've done something that He is displeased with, that He calls sin, but I also will forsake that sin, and I also will seek God for direction in my life. And so repentance is what he's speaking about and restoration. And it's not just feeling bad about doing something wrong. There are numbers of people who regret what they have done. They regret it because what they've done has had repercussions. They feel bad about it. But that's not what we're looking at today. David isn't saying, I simply felt bad or I regretted something. David is saying that I sinned and I needed to confess to God and I needed to be restored. Turn with me for just a moment, please, to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. As I lay this foundation, I'd like to point this out to you in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we get an insight into what godly repentance is and the results of godly repentance. And I want you to see this because I'm going to develop this with you out of this psalm. The psalm is a very powerful psalm. It's a psalm that has been adopted by the church with a particular relish because we who are Christians understand that we need to ask God for forgiveness of our sins and we need to ask God to give us restoration. And, uh, and I wanted to point this out to you in my introduction because I think it's very important that we understand that confession of sin... Uh, is not simply just a, a recognition that I've done something wrong, but a genuine confession of sin is to acknowledge that I've sinned against God and to ask God to do a work in my life of restoration and forgiveness. And when I have a godly sorrow, it produces a fruit in my life. Look at chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 here in 2 Corinthians, and notice how the Apostle Paul says it. He says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. 
What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. See, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation with no regret. And so when you actually are repenting because you're sorrowful about what you've done, then there's a joy that comes as a result of that. And so this is what we're looking at as we turn on back to Psalm 32. This is what David is speaking about. He's speaking concerning the fact that if, if we ask God for forgiveness, God will forgive us. And so he begins in verses 1 and 2 here in Psalm 32 by saying, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. The word blessed speaks of, of happy, of overjoyed. And he speaks concerning the fact that we are going to be overjoyed when we have been forgiven of our sin. And I want you to notice in the first two verses that he uses three words that we usually just use one word uh, to describe. And he uses three words to speak of sin. He speaks of transgression. He uses the word sin. And he also uses the word iniquity. Transgression is an act of disobedience. It's an act of disloyalty or rebellion. The word sin speaks of an action that misses, sometimes unintentionally, the clearly expressed will of God. And the word iniquity speaks of a crooked or a wrong action, often the result of a decision to do wrong. And he's saying, blessed is the man whose complete sin picture has been covered by God. Blessed is the man, or happy is the man, that, that God does not impute iniquity to. Notice as he speaks here in verse 2 that he says that the Lord forgives those who sincerely seek him for forgiveness. And so this rejects the hypocritical actions that are not based on true repentance. Sometimes people may cry. They may even beg somebody, please forgive me, when in reality they're not really sorry at all for what they've done. They haven't repented from what they've done. They're simply regretting what they have done and all. And we sometimes can even hypocritically say, God, forgive me, when in reality... We're not genuinely repentant whatsoever. We're not really asking God for forgiveness. So forgiveness is really the grounds of true rejoicing. Truly understanding that God has completely forgiven us will give joy to us in our life. Now notice what happens when we don't ask for forgiveness. Verse 3, he says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. And then he uses the word salah. The word salah means think about this or meditate on this. Now, the conviction that David was experiencing, and I'm going to develop this with you for a moment, the conviction of sin that David was experiencing had led him to become spiritually depressed and drained continually. It was unrelenting. His spiritual life is simply drying up like a plant that is withering in the sun. And David learned the hard way that unconfessed sin festers and causes anguish and suffering. Now, the question has to be asked, what is he speaking about? We need to remember that David had committed a serious sin against the Lord. He had committed adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. Not only had he taken the wife of one of his loyal men, a man by the name of Uriah the Hittite. But he had taken her. He had had physical intimacy with her. She had conceived, notified him that she was carrying his child, and he tried to cover his sin up. He tried to do that by calling Uriah from the field. He was there, and he was, uh, he was fighting. There was a battle going on. He had Uriah the Hittite brought in from the field, and then he spoke to him, asking him, really trying to pretend that he was interested in how things were going in the battle and all. Then he tried to send Uriah home to sleep with Bathsheba, his wife, in order that Uriah would think that he impregnated her while he was there on leave. But Uriah was a noble man. Instead of going home, he just stayed there with uh, the soldiers or the servants of David in David's house and would not go home. David heard about that the next day. And when he discovered that, he brought Uriah back in, and he said, why didn't you go home? 
Uriah said, My men are in the field right now. Should I have pleasure with my wife and eat well and all while they're in the middle of a battle? I can't do that. So David actually gave him uh, things to drink and got him drunk and tried to get him to go home to sleep with his wife. But he wouldn't do it the second time. We know the story. We know what happened. David called his general Joab in, and he said, This is what I want you to do. I want you to take Uriah, and I want you to put him in the heat of the battle. And when you do that, I want you to have the troops withdraw their protection from him, and I want him to die. And that's exactly what took place. So not only did David commit adultery, but David was also a party to murder. And when that took place, God sent a prophet by the name of Nathan to address David concerning his sin. And Nathan came in and spoke to this one-time shepherd boy and gave to him an illustration that related to a small ewe lamb or little girl lamb. And he gave an illustration concerning a man who had a little ewe lamb, he says, that was more like a family member than a pet. This is a little girl lamb that he was in love with. And he says, and he raised it from being a baby as it was growing up. It became a family member. And, and then one day, a, a rich man came and took his lamb and slaughtered that lamb and, and fed a visitor with the lamb. And Nathan asks uh, David, what should be done to this man? And David got extremely upset. And David said, the man should die, and he ought to repay this man for what he has done. As a result of that, Nathan looks at him and says to him those famous words, you are the man. And he pointed out the sin of David. And as he pointed out the sin of David, he said, violence will not leave your house. The thing that you did in secret will be known openly. Now, David is talking here in Psalm 32 about how he felt in the, in the meantime, in between the time that he had had relations with Bathsheba, and then he ultimately had confessed and forsaken his sin. And the fact is that as you study the, the passages that relate to this, it took around a year until he could no longer take it. It took about a year for him until he got to the point where he said, I can't take this anymore. And he describes what his life was like when he says, day and night, in verse 4, your hand was heavy upon me. He said, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. In verse 3, he said, I kept silent. My bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. He said, my spiritual life dried up. That's what happens when we enter into sin. That's what happens when we're not quick to confess and forsake. And some of us in this room understand how hard-hearted and hard-headed we can become sometimes. When the Lord is, is convicting us of sin, and we continue in it and attempt to ignore him. But what's the remedy? Well, notice verse 5. He said, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What did I do? I admitted that I'd sinned, and I openly confessed, and I repented. If you take notes, you might want to note 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. In that scripture... John writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sin, that word confess is the Greek word homologeo. It simply means if we say the same thing or if we agree with God that this is a sin. Some people will argue with God that it's not, but God's word declares that it is. And therefore, if we confess, we're simply agreeing with him. If we confess our sin, notice he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Faithful and just. In other words, you can rely on God to keep His Word to forgive you and to cleanse you. And He cleanses you by the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, no matter how great and no matter how small the sin may appear. And so the key in order for restoration and to have a re renewed life, the key to have vigor once again in the Spirit is to acknowledge sin, to turn away from it, and receive forgiveness. And that's what David does. In verse 6, he says, For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you. In a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. So David encourages everyone to call on God in their time of trouble. And he's saying God will protect you and God will be your refuge and God will cause you to rejoice when he delivers you. And by the way, rejoicing is the fruit of genuine repentance and restoration. I can remember when I got saved, and I came home from that meeting that I attended that day. There was a newfound joy in my heart, this knowledge that my sins really had been covered and forgiven by God. 
And that's what happens when you turn away from your sin. And then there's another result, verse 8. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Don't be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else it will not come near you. God is promising for those who are committed to him that he will guide them, and he will guide you in your life. He's going to instruct you, and he's going to guide you. Yesterday I was speaking to my son Joseph, and Joseph has to do a do a, a, in his Bible class at in Murrieta Bible College, he has to put together a, a, a short devotional study, and he said, Dad, I'm going to give the study in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And that's a great, great portion of Scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And that's what David is promising here. Actually, this is what God is promising through the pen of David. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And I've shared with you before that when you're, when you're in fellowship with the Lord, wherever God is looking, that's how he's guiding you because your fellowship is so strong with him through his word, he actually directs you. And he says in verse 9, don't be hard-headed. Don't be like a horse or a mule. They have no understanding. Verse 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And so he basically closes by saying those who reject God very often just have very troubled lives. Those who trust in him, on the other hand, will experience love and mercy. And experiencing the love and mercy of God ultimately causes them to rejoice and shout for joy. Psalm 33, and I know we're not going to get to Psalm 34, but we'll do our best. And this earth piece here, where's my guys? I'm going to take this thing off. Can you put me on this? It's driving me crazy. I'm free. <laughs> you know, when you're talking and you feel it pulling on the side of your head, you're going, oh boy, I got to stop this real quick. Okay, now God, will you please anoint me? Thank you, amen. <laughs> Psalm 33, beginning at verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Now, as we look at this particular psalm, notice with me that worship in Israel was often loud and joyous. It might surprise you if you ever have the opportunity to go with us to Israel. And by the way, we are praying about going to Israel again next year. And some people are thinking, are you crazy? Are you going to go to Israel? You know, what if you get killed there? Well, we're going to get killed somewhere, aren't we? So Israel's just as good as any other place, I guess. But we are praying about it, and we are considering uh, going there next year because it's actually a lot more safe than most people uh, would realize. But anyway, if you ever had a chance to go, we've been there when they've been having their bar mitzvah ceremonies there at the Western Wall. And when you arrive there in, the, uh, in what has been traditionally called the Wailing Wall, and some of you know that th through being in Israel yourself perhaps, or, or, or seeing documentaries or, or whatever, you know, when you're there, you, you will see that the, uh, the kids who are being bar mitzvah, there are people who are, um, are rejoicing and, and, and their, their, their voices are actually very loud. I mean, it was... Uh, the first time I encountered that, you would hear these ladies who were, or they sounded like what we used to see on, on our old uh, westerns where you'd hear, you know, uh, a very loud uh, cry, you know, with, with no words. It was just, you know, they were just la 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 la, but really loud. And I was there with Pastor Chuck the first time I saw this, and I turned to Pastor and I said to him, Pastor Chuck, I said, just exactly what is the significance of these ladies who keep on raising their voice and, and, and yelling like that? And he says, well, the scripture says make a joyful noise. And that's what they're doing. And I was fascinated by that. And you might be surprised at, at the amount of joyous celebration in, in Hebrew worship, in Hebrew songs of praise. And sometimes we don't realize that, but this is what he's talking about here in the first three verses. He's speaking concerning celebration, and that's why he says rejoice in the Lord, you're righteous. Praise from the uprights, beautiful. 
Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody with, uh, to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. And so he's speaking about worship, and he's, and he's encouraging the congregation of God's people who gather together to sing loud praises to the Lord. Now, they're going to sing loud praises to God for one reason, not so that they can have attention drawn to themselves, but because they're excited about the relationship with Him. Now, think with me for just a moment. Some of you may relate to this. Others may not. But I know that sometimes, like when you were growing up and everything, did you ever, ever play the air guitar? Did you ever get your hairbrush and just singing it like you were one of those famous people that you were singing along with? Anybody ever do that? You ever turn on the radio and you're just driving along and you, you're the lead singer. Are you ever the melody? I mean, harmony? No, you're always the lead singer. You've always got the best voice and everything. And thank God nobody's listening to you as you do that. But you sing loudly. And I've seen that off. I've seen that. I've done that. You sing loudly. Sing loudly with the songs that you enjoy. And then we come to church. And, and nobody, no, that's not true, you know, some people don't care, but a lot of people are very, very awkward about worship. I really want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that as you worship the Lord to raise your voice and sing praise to Him because He's the one who's listening. Now, of course, if the person in front of you has got their hands over their ears, they, they may be giving you a silent signal, I'm not sure. But the bottom line is, is that we ought to be singing the Lord and praising God. Now, why is that? Well, we, we sing to Him this new song because we've been delivered by Him. There's songs of praise and celebration because the Lord has saved us. And that's what we do. And this is something the congregation did at that time. And this is something the church is commanded to do. In Ephesians, in chapter 5, verse 19, now Paul said that we are to speak to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so he's calling us to worship and praise. Now, why do you worship and praise God? Verses 4 and 5, he says, For the word of the Lord is right. All his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Well, we worship and praise the Lord because he's righteous, because he's just, because he's good, because he tells the truth. We praise him because his word is without error and his word is without deceit. The Bible in 2 Samuel 7, 28 says, Lord God, you are God and your words are true. Jesus in John 17, 17 said, sanctify them by your truth for your word is truth. And so we worship and praise God because he's truthful to us. His word gives to us his truth. Not only that, in, he says in verse 6 and 7, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. All the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. We also worship God because he created all things. And he should be worshiped because of his majestic power. All creation came into existence through his word, both the spoken word as well as the living word, and God should be praised for that. In Isaiah 45, 12, he said, I have made the earth, created man on it, my hands, stretched out the heavens, and all their host I have commanded. In verse 7, notice it says, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. It's a picture of a, a farmer who's gone onto his land and has, and has gathered up his crops and put them in a storehouse. But when you imagine for a moment the picture he's given us, and that's something we, we, we sometimes fail to do. When you imagine the picture that he's giving to us, you have to imagine for a moment that he's speaking about all the seas and waters of the world. And he's saying God is so powerful and majestic that he's able to gather up all the waters and place them in a storehouse the way some farmer can go and gather some grain and put it in a barn. So it's a picture of God's power and his majesty. That's why you worship and that's why you praise him. In verses 8 and 9, he continues and says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. He spoke, it was done. He commanded, it stood fast. He's the God of the universe. He's not some God of a certain location, unlike the pagans who had concepts of gods of various things like earth, sky, water, whatever. God is the God of everything, and nothing is accidental. 
all creation came into existence through his plan, and therefore you worship and you praise him. Verse 10 through 12, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen as his inheritance. In other words, God is in control of every nation and they must come to recognize this fact. And he blesses those who belong to him. That's why the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this concerning the church. That's why Peter said you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we have been chosen specially by God. Notice verse 12 when he says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. He's speaking not only of Israel, but by way of application, he's also speaking of the people of God, which could include us, his church. We are the people whom he has chosen as his own inheritance. Verse 13, the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. God should be worshiped because God sees and God knows everything. Now, verse 15 is an interesting verse. I want to share a couple moments about this. Look at verse 15 with me again, please. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. What do you mean he fashions? That word fashions in, in, the, word, in the Hebrew means he molds them. He molds them individually. What are you saying when you say you fashion hearts individually and consider all their works? Well, he's basically saying this. God influences people by his grace. He intends to mold people into godly individuals. In other words, through your lifetime, God has allowed certain things that would have been earmarks or foretaste, if you will, of his, of his grace into your life with a desire to bring you to the place where you would commit yourself to him and be used by him. And as I speak to believers here in this, in this fellowship right now, There are probably things now, if you were to look back into your past, prior to Christ, prior to being saved, that you can actually see have been used by God now that you're saved, though you didn't understand that the influences that were being wielded on you at that time were actually going to be usable in your Christian life. I've shared this with you more than once, how that when I was a little boy, because my mother had read a little bit of the Bible and had read a, a phrase in the scriptures, and a little child shall lead them, how my mother used to come and sit down with me when I was about six years old, as I can recall, and my mom would ask me for advice. And the reason she would ask me for advice is because she had read the Bible, a little child should lead them, and she thought, well, maybe God has given a special wisdom to children. So my mom would actually, as I was eating breakfast, ask me questions. Now, she never, never really made it clear that she was looking for counsel from a six-year-old. What she would do, though, is she would use illustrations. And as she used illustrations with me, she'd say there was a lady who was hurt by another lady, and what should the lady do? And I would be eating my cereal, and I'd say, well, the lady who was hurt ought to tell the lady who hurt her that she's hurt. And my mom would take that as counsel, and she'd actually act on it. I didn't realize that as a little boy, by talking to my mom and answering questions at the age of six that I was actually being led into the ministry where I do a lot of counseling like that even to this day. I was speaking to some people recently, uh, members of our Spanish ministry and all, and uh, I was saying to them that as I was growing up as a little boy, in my home, my dad would not speak Spanish to us. My dad very seldom, if ever, spoke Spanish, and the words that he used I can't repeat. So my dad didn't use, he didn't speak to us in Spanish. He just didn't do that. My mom did. My mom would speak to me as a child in English and Spanish. And as she would speak in English and Spanish to me, I would wait for her to give me the English translation. 
and I got lazy and I didn't pick up Spanish because she'd say it in Spanish, then she'd say it in English, and then she'd use Spanglish, you know, a mixture of the two. And this may be interesting to you because that was helping me to begin to understand certain rudiments of language and all, but this is what was really interesting, and, and to me it's tragic in one way, and yet I see the benefit in another. My grandmother never learned to speak English. My grandmother died at the age of 92, never became an American citizen. My, my grandmother died a Mexican citizen. She had a, a green card when she died at the age of 92. But I never had a conversation with my grandmother in my entire life. I never had the ability to communicate to my own grandmother. But you know what we would do when my dad would take us over to see my grandmother? Is my mom would sit down and would translate our conversations. So my grandmother would speak to me in Spanish, my mom would hear, and then my mom would speak to me in English. Then I would speak in English to my mother, who would speak to my grandmother. And that's how I had conversations with my own grandmother until my grandmother died. Yet, I can now speak through translators very easily because I have that skill from all of my life. So I know how to phrase, I know how to not use a lot of words, I know how to use certain words that can be translated easily. I learned to do that before I was saved. Yet God uses that in my ministry today. So when I've gone to other countries, not just in South America or Mexico where I need translators, and by the way, I hate to be introduced as Rosales because they expect me to speak Spanish and then I can't. And I'd rather go to China. <laughs> but I've had translators in, in Germany and I've had translators in Japan and various places. And I've learned to speak through translators. India, I've learned to speak through translators in that way. So God has influences of grace in your life that are intended to mold you in the direction that he would have you to go. That's what he's speaking about in verse 15 when he says he fashioned their, fashions their hearts individually, considers all the works. God gives you ample opportunity to, uh, to come to know him through the influences that he brings into your life. And yet, if you're stubborn and resistant, then ultimately, as he says in verse 15, he considers all your works because you're self-willed and, and stubborn, they're judged for the rejection of the influences it has brought into their life. And so we ought to look back at what God has shown us over the years, and we ought to receive them is the point that he's making. In verse 16, no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not de delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. Now, as I was reading, especially verses 16 and 17, how it says, no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Bottom line, man may make their military plans, but it's going to be God who gives them victory in battle. That's one of the reasons why, though we, the United States, have the finest fighting force, I believe, in the world, that doesn't guarantee victory, does it? That's why we have to keep our troops in prayer. That's why we have to pray for those who are over them and giving them orders while they're there in the field. Because ultimately, we need to understand who gives victory. Who is going to give the victory? It's not going to be the, uh, the armaments. It's not going to be the strategies. We need to depend on the Lord. and We need to humble ourselves before him. And that's the point that David is making here. When he says in verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord, he is our help and our shield. Our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Now that's the bottom line. God wants us to demonstrate our, our trust and faith in him in a variety of ways. And I want you to notice these things. Uh, one is, is we are to hopefully trust in him. That's what he's saying in verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He's our help and our shield. We hopefully wait on him and trust in him. 
He says in verse 21, our heart shall rejoice in him. We rejoice because we can trust him. And then finally, he says in verse 22, let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us. We continue praising him and we continue asking God that he might pour out his mercy upon us as we hope and trust in him. And so why should we rejoice in the Lord? We rejoice in the Lord because he is the God of creation, because his word is true, because he protects us every day, because he, he loves us and shows his mercy to us. How should we worship him? Well, we, wor we worship him openly. We worship him loudly. We praise God with a full and complete heart. Do we do it individually? Yes. Do we do it as a congregation? Absolutely. And as we do so, we're demonstrating that we understand that the Lord really is our Savior, that he really did save us. Of all people, Christians ought to be the first and foremost at worship because we have the true God that we worship. And we should have all the joy. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ saved us, because he gave to us new life, because he's given to us peace with God, because he has filled our heart with his love. And so as a result of that, we of all people should be worshipers of God because God has done that work in our life. And that's what he's talking about, and that's what he's writing about here in Psalm 33. We better pray.